Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens, the historic treasure of Akron and all of Northeast Ohio. The Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens Guild supports and promotes our beloved local historic landmark. Presents Harriet Chapman, granddaughter of the Cyberlane's third son, Penfield, speaking about beautiful Fairlawn Heights, history of an idyllic suburban neighborhood. Recorded at the May 17, 2022 Guild Meeting, held in the Carriage House Meeting Room at Stan Hewitt Hall. How many of you live in Akron, in the city of Akron? In the city, okay. And, and you know, we know we have quite a hilly city. I mean, Akron for Akros, Acropolis, Hill, Summit County, um, High County. Um, so, so what I never realized as a child, and in studying for this, in studying for this presentation, what I what I found out and what I learned is that going to good? Okay, is that okay? Is that good? Okay. Um, what I what I learned, I guess what 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 reacquainted me with the, the city in which I grew up was that we we have all these massive hills. West Hill really is a giant hill on the west side, and that's why Highland Square used to be known as West Hill and North Hill, and. Um, uh, and, and Fairlawn Heights was, was not just the heights for some hoity-toity name. It actually is this giant ball of rock. It's a giant half dome of rock. And it's got some crags in it. But it's really a giant uh, half dome of rock. And, 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 and um, what was interesting to me in looking at the topography and, and in the geology of, of the neighborhood, um, you know, People have lovely homes there, but boy, there was a massive flood in 2003 because the sewers um, were 100 years old and they were dug out of solid rock. So there's really no place to go. When you replace the sewers, you're gonna have to dig in there, you're gonna have to replace them with pipes, and you're gonna have to go through rock. And, and heights means you're on a rock. And all the basements had to be blasted out. So if you have a basement in Farallon Heights, you ha it was dynamited. And my parents only had a three-quarter basement because either the McQueens didn't need a, whole, a full one or they just didn't want to spend the money for further dynamiting. And, uh, and you also get the pleasure of knowing that you live on a rock when it rains. And when the water, and in your old house, when the, when the land has settled and the water comes in and you see that lovely, you know, coming down the sides of your basements. And everybody in that neighborhood has had to redo their basements. So I, I looked at, when I started this presentation, I was looking at, you know, Frank Cyberling had bought the land and he started buying the land in the, in the early 1900s. Um, I guess in the, in the 19 teens, I should say. He started buying land. And, and as Julie Fry will tell you, he owned land all over uh, Summit County. Uh, not and, and also in Florida, of course, but he owned land in Copley Township. He owned land um, uh, out in Springfield. Um, he owned uh, land in Norton, where I just came from. Uh, he owned uh, one of the family farm, one of the Cyberling farms, which is still in the family, owned by another Cyberling descendant in Norton. But he was buying land, and, and, and like Gerald O'Hara said in Gone with the Wind, the only thing, you, uh, you'll come to love the land, Katie Scarlett, it's the only thing that lasts. And I listened to that uh, in Gone with the Wind, and I read it in the book, and I thought, boy, that actually, and, and Margaret Mitchell wrote that, of course, and that's actually, everybody who, who makes money, has money, or keeps money owns land. Bob Hope was the largest landowner in California. So Frank Cyberling at, at one time, so Frank, uh, largest private landowner in California at one time. So Frank Cyberling was thinking along these ways. Land is going to be a great thing to buy and hold, and it's a great thing to buy and develop, and it's a great thing to buy and sell. And when his other um, investments might go south, land was always going to help uh, keep him afloat. And indeed, uh, that proved true in two instances. It proved true when he had to sell off his father's assets in 18, after the 1893 um, uh, uh, panic. Uh, it was a depression following 18, in 1893 and following. John F. Cyberling's uh, mower and reaper business was facing stiff competition and eventually became sucked into the giant uh, American harvester or international harvester combine of uh, all those mower and reaper businesses. Like the rubber business, there were thousands of little companies making mowers and reapers and farming equipment, and they consolidated to a very few. Just like there were 300 rubber companies between here and Lake Erie and, and uh, to, uh, to the Ohio State 
state border, and they consolidated to really the big four in Akron and a few smaller ones. So competition breeds uh, uh, innovation, but it also breeds consolidation. And Frank Cyberling knew eventually something's going to happen with my business interests, and, and investing in land is a good thing. So he bought, he was buying land in Copley Township, and that's uh, uh, Fairlawn Heights is in Copley Township. Uh, it was in Copley Township. So um, that cover, by the way, this is from a brochure from the 1930s after Frank Cyberling had sold the land. So this is nothing to do, but it's a it's a nifty brochure, um, and it was made in the 1930s by the Fairlawn Heights Company. Uh, which was then run by E.O. Handy, and I'm going to get into him and how he relates to the Cyberlings, but Ned Handy. Um, uh, and this is a nifty brochure from the 30s, and, and it's available on the Fairlawn, neighbor, Fairlawn Heights Neighborhood Association website, or I can send you a PDF. It's a really neat uh, brochure. So my agenda tonight is I've already started discussing Fairlawn Heights in context, the selection of that area, why, why move west out of the city of Akron, um, to those of you who guide here, you're probably, you know, that's an easy question, so I'll probably skip through that pretty fast. But the men who made it happen, you know them. Uh, the aftermath of the crash, what happened to the land and, and the development. The road name changes were very interesting. Um, and then early residents, I, in doing research for this presentation, I found that there were so many wonderful human stories in that neighborhood that I knew nothing about growing up. You know, you're a little kid and you love your big trees and your tire swing and your, you know, your bicycle riding, but and your friends right nearby. But boy, you find out about some of the the truly amazing life stories uh, of the people that built homes there. It's it's just fantastic. And um, then we're going to get into homes by Roy Firestone, who is a very well-known local architect, uh, probably related to the Firestone family, but not very immediate. Uh, you know, it probably has to go way back. He's not he's not closely related to the Columbiana County Harvey Firestone. Stone family. Um, and then uh, Fairlawn Heights Golf Club, we'll talk about that, and some peculiarities of the neighborhood, and then the schools that were located there and nearby. And then uh, something that nobody really wanted, but everybody values today. I live six tenths of a mile from a highway exit. And uh, I'm very grateful for that now. I think the residents who built there were not so excited to have that huge highway go right by. But um, the trees here, all the photographs I took uh, in Fairlawn Heights, I took them in the fall or the summer. Um, so this is one of those roads. Uh, the road is a lot more mundane than this, but it was a beautiful fall day, and the camera does wonderful things. And it does, it does make you realize as you're walking around taking pictures how pretty it is and how curvy and, and neat the roads are. And that's all due to Warren Manning, who followed the landscape. Warren didn't imprint his ideas on Fairlawn Heights. He followed the landscape and used its beauty to make it lovely for all the residents. So where are we? Fairlawn Heights uh, in, in geographic and topographical context. Um, I said it was in Copley Township, and indeed uh, it, it, is, it was located um, in the 1856 Summit County map. I'm a map person. If any of you want to get into Summit County history, I highly recommend getting into maps. And I do have one here tonight that I recently um, uh, that was recently given to the Norton Historical Society, and I'll spread that out because it's a really cool map that I'd never seen. It's from 1910. These are all available online in the Akron Public Library. But the 1856 map of Summit County uh, shows uh, 16 years after Summit County's founding all of the townships that comprise the county. And of course, prior to its founding, it was Medina and Portage. It was, it was, it was created out of Medina and Portage counties in 1840. So the city of Akron, of course, predates um, Summit County. Uh, but this is the Matthews and Tainter 1856 Summit County map. Uh, if you buy one that is the actual size, it's about 5'3", about my height, and it's about 4 feet wide. It's a wonderful map. Um, but you can get it online through the Akron Public Ma Library's online map room, and it shows you the 16 townships. And the ones that we're concerned about are Copley and Portage. And Fairlawn Heights is located in that upper northeast uh, area of Copley Township. And one thing, um, I'll just point this out here, I'll yell a little bit, but uh, you know, here's, here's Market Street. I mean, here's the Market and Exchange Nexus right here, so that's Wallhaven, and you just keep going west, and then, and, and you, you, in 1856, you were getting into Copley Township, um, but uh, Fairlawn Heights was kind of carved out of this area here. Uh, Fairlawn School, however, interestingly, was in Portage Township. So the school that became Fairlawn Elementary School and is now Resnick was in Portage, but Fairlawn Heights is right, right up here. And John F. Cyberling, uh, Frank's and Charlie's father, uh, owned land way over here. And we'll see that, I think, in the 1874 map. And of course, Copley Center. I mean, all of these landmarks that we drive around today uh, that have just gotten bigger and maybe experienced sprawl, but they were there in 1856 and 1874. You can see the, the uh, footprint. 
So I just got a little closer here and showed you where uh, the, the uh, neighborhood is carved out uh, right there. And I include in the neighborhood, because it was included originally, the Fairlawn Heights Golf Club, now known as Fairlawn Country Club. So uh, all of that acreage is there, and I'll get into how many acres that was. But that's where it was carved out. And interestingly, Ridge Road, well, Ridge Road, Ridgewood Road was named appropriately because it's on a ridge. And it's on a very high ridge, and it goes straight west, just about straight west, all the way into Copley and then into Medina. Um, and Ridgewood Road is uh, the, the uh, dividing line. It's on the Continental Divide. And I didn't know that until I started researching uh, this presentation. So here we are, we're getting a little bit closer with each map. And this is Copley Township, the northeast corner. And again, we're looking at 1856 now. So um, you'll see some street name inspirations with the names in blue, Samuel Rothrock. Everybody knows Rothrock Road and the controversy that happened with Walmart potentially going up near there. Um, Simon, Simon Perkins's land. Oh, and I thought I'd put it on, I thought I'd put it on airport, or air, airline, so there we go. Everything, that's, everything that can go wrong is going wrong. I haven't tripped yet. I, this caught, I tripped with this. But um, Simon, Simon Perkins' land uh, is, is down here in the lower right near Shackalog Pond, which became Shackalog Pond. Simon Perkins owned land all this far west. And you know it's, it's at least two and a half miles or three miles west of his mansion now. And then in 1917, you see the yellow boundary, which is the Fairland Heights boundaries approximate. And present day street names I have put in red. So uh, you can see the schoolhouse was there at the corner um, of Miller Road and Ridgewood Road. That is where there is empty land for sale right now. It's right across from the Circle K. Uh, but there was a schoolhouse there. And then uh, the Lake Erie and Western Railroad was uh, traveling uh, through or uh, actually behind Fairlawn Heights. That's still there. Um, and then you see that Johnston, Johnston, it, there was a Johnston Road and a Parker Road. These are all farmers that own land there. John Wiley, his road was named Wiley Road. And then unfortunately, when Akron annexed it, it became Ely Road, E-L-Y, uh, because there was already a Wiley Road. So these poor farmers whose land was used for Farallon Heights uh, lost their names when Akron annexed Some of them lost the names of the roads when Akron annexed it. Shackalog Pond became Shackalog Pond. Shackalog Road goes right by that pond. Most of us didn't even know it was there. I didn't until I researched this presentation. So here's my present day overlay. Thank you, Google Maps. Have to give them attribution. But this shows you Fairlawn Heights, and it is identified in Google Maps uh, as the neighborhood. And it shows you that white line that goes right through it, and that's Ridgewood Road, and that is on the Continental Divide. The water that goes north uh, flows into Lake Erie. Uh, the water on the south side of it uh, flows uh, south into eventually the Mississippi. And I go, I go into that a little bit later. Miller Road is that big white road north. And then, of course, you can see where the highway uh, in the mid-60s started coming by. Um, so the residents weren't too happy about that, but it's great when you have to commute to Cleveland. Um, Portage Township, the northwest corner of Portage Township. I thought it'd be interesting to show you this because we get into uh, where Stan Hewitt, Stan Hewitt is in Portage Township, uh, or what was. And you see Simon Perkins' land. And a note, more street name inspirations, Merriman Road. Um, and then you see the current streets, Garmin Road, the schoolhouse that is owned by um, uh, Progress Through Preservation is identified there, West Market and Exchange Streets and Hawkins. So all of these landmarks that we know today uh, have been there for quite some time. And just like the Portage Path, uh, you know, we've, we've kept them and preserved them. And you can see there the Crooked River, the Cuyahoga River. Now we're getting into topography. And I, I loved looking at this map and the topographical maps that are conveniently available on the internet. Um, I found out, and I know this from exercising in that neighborhood, um, the vertical drop from the highest point on Stockbridge Road, which is near a water tower, uh, to uh, Hampshire Road, where I live, is 60 feet, which is roughly five stories. So I'm walking up about five stories if I do my power walking up to Stockbridge Road. And Stockbridge is, um, it's this little, it's right here, da da da, here's, Stockbridge is here. So Stockbridge, you can see, is kind of a nifty loop on a ridge, on a, on a very, um, uh, on a cliff, really. This is, these are really cliffs here. And so Stockbridge is really the highest point here. And then we're going down to Hampshire, which is kind of the midway, midpoint of the dome of Fairlawn Heights. And then the low point I'm, I'm calling Market Street. So that West Market Street near the golf course uh, is 110 feet below Stockbridge Road. So almost 10 stories difference. Uh, between the highest point of Fairland Heights and the lowest point. What is that equivalent to? It is equivalent to um, 
just about an equivalent drop from the top of Sand Run Road to Sand Run Parkway, if you can think of that. And it's 40% of the drop you experience when you drive from Surik Smith Road, that, that intersection of where Surik Road comes into Smith, uh, right by the Hampton, uh, Hampton Ridge and, and uh, Brookwood. And you go down, down that deep valley drop into the, to the Valley Railroad, it's only 40% of that height. But you know that's one of the biggest drops in our area, and I thought it was neat that Fairlawn Heights was even that it, it, that significant of a drop. But these topographical maps are fascinating. Um, you can see uh, the vertical drops, so Stockbridge is in the yellow star. Uh, the green star is Hampshire Road. This is the map turned around from the way I just looked at it, and then of course uh, West Market Street and, and the Fairlawn Golf Club. So it um, and 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 uh, or you can see yeah the yellow star there is where Fairlawn Golf Club is. So from from Stockbridge up here down there is 110 feet. So uh, 19, the, the, the size, what are we talking about when we talk about Fairlawn Heights? Um, we're talking about 1917 boundaries and then other boundaries throughout time. But the 1917 boundaries included the golf course, and that was uh, about 3 quarters of a square mile. Um, so, uh, and I'll get back to it. The 2021 boundaries with the golf course and Overwood and Wheaton uh, roads is one, almost 1 and a half square miles. And then the 2021 boundaries without the golf course uh, with Overwood and Wheaton is about 1.3 square miles. So it kind of depends. What are you, you know, what are you talking about when you talk about Fairlawn Heights, and where do you draw the boundaries? There are a lot of us who grew up in that neighborhood that didn't realize Overwood Road and Wheaton Road were part of Fairlawn Heights. But indeed, in the original conception of the neighborhood, that was all part of Fairlawn Heights because the Fairlawn Golf Club was meant to serve all those people that were going to buy and build their homes there. So this is a wonderful map, um, and, and God bless the internet uh, and the technology, you know, the, the brilliant people that created it. But the, the St. Lawrence Continental or Hydrological Divide runs right through Fairlawn Heights. And uh, I wish, you know, I, 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 I loved history as a kid, but now I'm really into it. And it's so fascinating to understand um, how our nation is, is formed geologically as well as uh, in, in, in other respects. So the drainage of water flow, which I discussed, north of Ridgewood Road goes to the Great Lakes and south uh, goes down to uh, the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, the, the drainage divide or watershed or ridge line is the inspiration for Ridge Road or Ridgewood Road. And that purple line is what we're talking about here, uh, and that goes right through Fairlawn Heights. So that's a nifty little fact about Akron I really didn't know. By the way, I have to recommend to you, if you need a good Father's Day gift or a birthday gift or Christmas gift, Written on the Hills by Francis McGovern is a fantastic book. There's also a small book, uh, it's a small volume, a cloth volume called The History of the Western Reserve. And both of them discuss our geology, our topography, how uh, the city and the area of Summit County was formed, and uh, why we are so fortunate to have the fresh water we do, the rivers we do, the hills we do, and the temperatures that we do. Um, this is a nifty other, another map with that red line. There's the Continental Divide. And then this is another map that shows the Ohio portion of the Lake Erie, Ohio River Drainage Divide. And literally, Ridgewood Road is part of that. So this is what I was talking about earlier. South of Ridgewood, you go to Shockalog Pond, Pigeon Creek, Wolf Creek, Tuscarawas River, Ohio River, Mississippi River, Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean. North of Ridgewood, you go to the Sand Run, the Fairlawn Country Club Brook, which is part of the Sand Run, the Cuyahoga River, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence, Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Atlantic. So it's kind of neat that the water actually, you know, the, the drops of water that fall on either side of Ridgewood Road won't meet for quite a while. The other interesting thing, and I've lived there, like I said, uh, uh, most of my life, um, but you walk through the neighborhood and you look at the stone formations and the rock outcroppings are quite, quite dominant, prevalent, and, and visible. And they also show you that if you buy a home there, you, know, you, you have to be willing to take care of your basement and some other issues because uh, a, a basement in stone, uh, if it's not well um, uh, insulated against water, you know, water is the enemy, as my brother says. So uh, Berea, what we have in Fairlawn Heights is Berea sandstone topped by a Sharon conglomerate. I didn't know what that was, but Francis McGovern explains it, so I recommend the book again. Um, Berea sandstone was quarried in and around Akron, and it was used to build St. Vincent and St. Bernard churches, and the old and the current courthouse. So you see it uh, when you drive downtown. Sharon conglomerate, which is shown here in the photograph, which is right on Ridgewood Road, uh, gives a, picture, a picturesque Disorder, I love this, this is Franny McGovern talking, a picturesque disorder to valley walls, 
jutting over silvering shales and shelving out of slopes in unexpected places. It looks like the craggy rock with ferny pockets. This sandstone is seen more often in its natural setting than Berea sandstone because it is newer, closer to the surface, and was only formed 280 million to 310 million years ago. I love her language. She's fantastic. And she was big into history as well. So I, that is just a great gem of a book. Uh, and, the, and here you can see how the trees are hugging. Those roots are hugging rock. That's why they're exposed. Uh, you know that a tree, only half the tree is visible. The other half is underground. Well, these, these uh, roots on rock have a, have a tough time clinging. Uh, and, and you do have to watch out for them. I had to remove five trees from my backyard this year. And it, it hurt, uh, both financially, but also because several of them were uh, on nearing 100 years old. But you know they had died. And uh, you don't want that falling on your house because the, the the, the depth of my soil compared, and like the depth of the Stan Hewitt soil, which you all found out during the drainage project, the depth of the soil in Fairland Heights is it's just not that deep of, of a soil uh, cover. So these are the obvious heights. This is a driveway on Ridgewood Road um, that goes into a house that I'll show you later in my presentation. Uh, this is another driveway that was created. That house was built by Phil Franz, if any of you know that name. Uh, the Baines own the home now, and it's a wonderful driveway, but they literally had to, had to build the rock face and then build the driveway along this ridge of rock and they heated they paid to heat the driveway because it was going it was so steep and uh, so they have heating under that driveway because they knew that uh, to get out you you you, you weren't going to walk down that driveway until you'd salted it and so they put a heating system under it Selecting the ideal spot for development. Well, this really was an ideal spot. While there were farms in Copley Township, a lot of it was very wooded. And Warren Manning found that out when Frank Cyberling asked him to take a look at the neighborhood and design a neighborhood, uh, take a look at the area and design a neighborhood out of it. This is just a, a lovely, uh, somebody planted trees in a row on off of Stockbridge Road. And this is an open lot. It's one of the few open lots in the, in the neighborhood. And it was so pretty in the fall. I wish I'd had a blue sky, but it was just awfully pretty to take that picture. So I, I, I quoted Gerald O'Hara at the beginning of my presentation. Land is the only thing in the world worth working for, worth fighting for, worth dying for, because it's the only thing that lasts, Katie Scarlett. So I, I, I just think that is such a prescient thing. And, and like I said, the, some of the wealthiest people in the world are those that own land and keep it. Um, so Frank Cyberling knew the area very well. Uh, as early as 1893, um, during the, uh, the, the before the panic, but also during a, the celebration of Columbus's uh, discovery of America, the Columbian Exposition, he and Gertrude went there uh, to Chicago. But Frank Cyberling and uh, Frank Wilcox together purchased 573 acres. That's a lot of land. Uh, the remainder of the W.C. Sackett lands in southeastern Copley Township. And I have a little story about that later. But um, So it's south of White Pond and south southeast of Black Pond uh, for $26,000. And John Cyberling, his father, had bought land there in Copley before 1891. And then um, Frank made two more purchases in Copley in 1895 and 96. So this is before Goodyear, while Frank is still working for his father at the uh, JF Cyberling Company, which made Empire Mowers and Reapers. So this is before Goodyear was a conception. And he's working for his dad there, of course. Uh, they didn't have a social safety net or a government safety net. So a lot of these men worked and invested in different businesses. So you will find, looking back, that some of the better known business names in Akron all invested in each other's businesses. There was a very solid web of co-investment and um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the word, but uh, in, investment in each other's businesses so that if one went south, you had, your, you had some money and income from another business. So Frank was on the boards of a couple of banks. Um, he invested in his brothers-in-law's uh, businesses. They invested in his. Uh, they were all invested in their father's JF Cyberling company, the Mower and Reaper Works, which of course, again, had to be liquidated after 1893. So John F. Cyberling's lands following that panic were key to his survival uh, to be you know, feeding him and his family and his remaining children that were still younger than Frank and Charlie. Um, uh, that the ability to sell that land was was really important, and so it, they were all smart to buy it. Um, the Sackett Farm. This is an article from uh, 1893, and it shows that um, these two men have owned this farm in Copley Township for three years, and today they disposed of it. Um, so uh, that that farm, uh, I learned last night at a Copley Township Historical Society meeting. 
Um, I'd never heard this, but apparently Frank Cyberling invested in a company that was interested in those lands south of Shockalog and uh, Black, south of White Pond and south southeast of Black Pond. This tractor manufacturing company was interested in those lands to build a large industrial complex there with an accompanying neighborhood, much on the model of Goodyear or Firestone Park. It never happened because it, it, the, in, the, the business, uh, the men that were sponsoring it, and Frank Cyberling was one of apparently 100 men that kind of came together and thought this would be a great idea because these were virgin, not virgin lands, but they were farmlands and you know, nothing was there except farms. Um, but of course, 1920 to 21 was the 18 months of a deep depression. And uh, so it never happened. It was planned, but never happened. And I didn't know about this until last night. So thanks to Mr. Boughton of Boughton Farms, uh, who talked about that. Why select Copley Portage? I highlighted a couple of the, the um, salutary descriptions of the land from the 1910 Atlas of Summit County. Copley uh, has a little rough land in the eastern and southern parts, which would be uh, eastern would be Fairlawn Heights. Um, in the early days, there was much swampland, but human energy has overcome much of this by draining and ditching, and the result is some very valuable land. Wolf Creek and Pigeon Creek rise in the west and northwest. Shockalog Creek in the northern part. Shockalog Pond, white, black, and yellow ponds constitute the basins of water yet remaining and are utilized to good, exam to good advantage. So these are the descriptions in the atlas. Uh, the atlas, of course, was produced uh, for people to have, but it was really a big promotion uh, for people to buy land in this area. So the Chamber of Commerce would sell them. And uh, if you have an atlas today, they're wonderful to own and, and look through. But uh, definitely, there was advertising language used in them. It was that no, nobody was a sinner, and all the land was good, and uh, everything, all the economy was going to turn out right in those atlases. Um, and in Portage Township, west of the river and northwest of Akron will be found many of the finest residences in the county, all of which will be in a short course of time taken into the city of Akron. So there's a predictor for you of the annexation. It would take 22 more years, but everybody knew that annexation was coming because Akron was growing. And here is the example. So this is from the 1915 plat map of the city of Akron. And uh, again, it's just a great illustrator of where things were, and you can compare them to where things are today. Um, Akron was growing. Downtown obviously was in a valley. Um, I didn't notice that until finally I really started driving around Akron for researching this presentation and, and just realized you know, the, the West Hill, the North, North Hill, going east up, up Market Street. It's, just, it's amazing the hills that are just in that little downtown area. Fairlawn Village was literally just called a village. Kenmore Village was the same. These would later be annexed. Uh, new neighborhoods in existing suburban townships were growing up in Copley and Portage and Coventry and Springfield and Talmadge. So you can see the city of Akron is in light blue. The rubber companies are identified in purple. I should say the major rubber companies. I didn't identify all of them. But Firestone, Goodrich, and Goodyear you can see. Um, and then uh, the neighborhood, the royal blue are the neighborhoods which would uh, be, uh, which were happening or were about to happen. So Merriman Hills, Castle Park, Maple Valley, Goodyear Heights, one and two, and of course Firestone Park. Why move west? Well, if you didn't know and you and you didn't realize it, um, my parents remembered, you know, the smell of rubber. My mom particularly grew up with it. Um, if if the wind blew blew. Uh, uh, east to west, the, the west side of town definitely got a whiff of the smell, but it usually the prevailing winds were uh, west to east. So of course, those who wanted to escape the, the smells of rubber and the smoke moved west or moved north. And Frank Cyberling and his brother are good examples of that. Charlie uh, moved north after 1923 to Northfield Township. Blanche, his wife, had some health problems. Frank moved west, built Stan Hewitt uh, on a western promontory here, right again on a, a lovely rock ridge. But that is a great picture of what Akron looked like uh, in the early 1900s. And it was both the smell of rubber and the smell of money and jobs. So uh, no gain saying that. I mean, I am thank thankful that, that industry came here and made Akron as prosperous as it did. But the downside was, you know, if you wanted to move away, you had to move a little further out. This is a great picture, um, the YMCA building. Uh, this, is, this was taken from the YMCA building, which, is, which still stands, of course. Quaker Oats Mill is at the left. Um, a lot of that's been torn down. The Ohio Bell and uh, Telegraph building is right there at the center. That still stands right on Bowery Street. Children's Hospital, of course, today is all here. You know, that's all children's now. But um, uh, this is a great picture of Bowery. And then um, 
Uh, you can also see the Lowe's Theater, which is right here. This is Akron Civic Theater right here. And, and, and what's really neat is, you know, these are, this is all a parking lot now, but look at the homes. These are the uh, late Victorian homes built in, in the 1800s, um, you know, to be close to downtown. And they're wonderful rambling homes. You can all imagine the paneling, the crown molding, uh, the carved wood, the wonderful special windows that were in those homes. And there were hundreds of them, and they were just raised, you know, in the name of progress, which, which is, you know, that there's good and bad to everything, and that's, that's one of the losses. Um, but it's so interesting that they were so close to downtown and the factories. This is another great picture now looking at the YMCA building from the courthouse. You can see uh, the growth, and this is 1930. Now, the crash happened in October of 1929. But what is interesting, if you study that era, the Great Depression really didn't get really bad until about 1932 or 33. The, the, the trough really happened in the mid-30s. Um, and and uh, it, was, it was due, uh, well, I won't go there. But anyway, it, there, was, there were a lot of economic factors uh, that, and, and political factors that played into making the economy a lot worse off. And the 1920 to 21 Depression, no government funding, no government help, no government aid. About a half a million businesses went out of business. So uh, millions of jobs were lost in 1920 to 21, but it was an 18-month depression versus uh, a, a decade-long one. So um, it, 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 was, it, was, it was bad, but it was deep and fast, and the Great Depression kind of dragged on. But this is right before it got bad. So you can see there's all kinds of building going on. Of course, the first national tower went up during this era. And you can see, again, these dark homes right here. These are homes that had been, that had been there for probably 100 years. But Akron is growing around them. And you see the scaffolding. So uh, new buildings are coming. So again, you want to move west. So a lot of these people moving out of Akron were going to go west. Here is Warren Manning's early uh, plan. He, as early as 1917, uh, he had uh, walked the land of Farallon Heights and mapped out a complete neighborhood. Uh, already planning early plots of land for homes to go up, and then planning the future with a grid of streets. And the streets look very odd and off-center and um, asymmetrical because they follow that jagged rock that I showed you in some of those photographs. So it's really a wonderful, this is a wonderful map. And I do, um, this is a close-up version of the top half. I have this if you want to look at it sometime. Uh, and I do have a large version. Um, and and I, I have to thank and credit Jim Palau. I don't know how many of you know his name, but um, he uh, was a wonderful man I was privileged to meet when I first began guiding at Stan Hewitt in 1982. Jim was the maintenance guy at Stan Hewitt, and he forgot more than all of us will know about this place and about Akron. And God bless him, if he didn't collect every little scrap of paper, program, magazine, um, house plans, advertisement, uh, anything having to do with old Akron, he collected. So he had this mound, and his, his wonderful representative, John Miller, is here tonight. God bless you, John. Um, he saved everything Akron related. He went around to homes and asked for their plans. He asked to photograph home interiors, because he had this idea that these might not be around for very long, or progress might also involve changing the old, beautiful way of things. He left his entire collection to the University of Akron. So it is there to be viewed by all of us. And I can't recommend, if, you, if there's a rainy day and you need something to do, go down and visit the University of Akron archives and, and take a look at Jim Palau's collection of Akron memorabilia. It is fantastic, and you're going to see some of it here. He had this map of Warren Manning's 1917 plan. Um, I, I know Stan Hewitt has it, uh, but it's, it's just wonderful to, to see this. So the Lands Developer, Landscape Architect, and Development Company. I gave this talk to um, the Progress Through Preservation folks. So you obviously know who Frank Seiberling is and, and Warren Manning. So I won't go into a lot of that. But what I do have is some wonderful notes uh, that thanks to Julie Fry. Um, Julie has been uh, capturing Frank Seiberling's uh, papers down in Columbus. And so I have some notes. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm, I will not be boring. But I, I do want to kind of highlight some notes that she provided to me very kindly. Uh, that gives some insight into why Frank did what he did, why he went where he went, and what the decision making um, uh, was and what it cost him. So, so I explain to people who aren't familiar, this is Frank Augustus Cyberling, um, and, and, and of course he built Stan Hewitt and, and hired Warren Manning to be the landscape architect. What built Stan Hewitt? Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company's wonderful profits, and the, and the American consumer demanding to drive in cars, and Henry Ford and other industrialists like Frank Seiberling 
uh, who decided that they could figure out ways to make these products better, faster, and cheaper uh, so that more, more Americans could ride uh, farther, go farther, go faster, and, and the price just kept dropping. So as prices, uh, as, as more cars were made and as more tires were made, uh, sales boomed. So the, the, the rubber tire uh, was a fortunate, Frank Cyberling began Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, of course, thinking he's gonna make bicycle tires. He's gonna make rubber products for the home. He's going to make rubber carriage tires to make the ride easier on the brick streets. Um, he's going to make any kind of uh, you know, galoshes, rubber, rubber products that, that we would wear that help insulate us as human beings, but also our goods and, and, and belongings and our food. And then Henry Ford and the assembly line came along and the automobile and mass production, and boy, did that take off. So this is the hockey stick graph. I used the statistics in Hugh Allen's 1948 history of Goodyear. Uh, automotive tire output is in purple, sales are in yellow, and you can see by 1913, Goodyear is doing very well, but boy, by 1917, 18, 19, it's doing spectacularly. And but for a few uh, problems, um, a confluence, a perfect storm of political and economic and uh, uh, wartime problems, uh, Goodyear um, would have kept on that upward trajectory, and Frank and Charlie Cyberling might not have lost the company, frankly. That's a great story, and, and uh, my brother and I are researching that. But um, uh, you can see this, this is what built Stan Hewitt, and this is what was funding his purchase of land all over the county, because he knew that as Akron was growing, he could foresee uh, demand for land for both uh, industry and human beings, uh, private residences was going was gonna to grow. Warren Henry Manning, uh, what, a, what a creative mind and uh, what a blessing that he was able to come to Akron and affect the landscape here so positively. And um, uh, I recommend Gloria Schreiber. It's not actually, it's not her book, but she has written essays in the book. But there's that wonderful book on Warren Manning. Uh, it's a com compilation of essays. I highly recommend reading that. It gives insight into his various projects, not only in Ohio, but all across the nation. And it was very well researched. Um, but he, he was part of the movement. Um, it, he wasn't part of the City Beautiful movement. He was part of the City Scientific movement. Um, the City Beautiful movement was what the Chicagoans um, uh, used to create the Columbian Exposition. All those beautiful white buildings, the white city. If you heard of that, the, if you heard the term the white city, that's what was created in Chicago for the World's Fair, 1892 to 93. Beautiful, geometrically um, precise, uh, careful boulevards, buildings that were beautifully square or, or had, ra you know, had very distinct shapes. There was no chaos, there was no messiness, there was no asymmetry in the white city for the Columbian Exposition. That's the city beautiful movement, if I have to kind of try to get you to understand what that is. And I, I, had, to, I had to put this in my own terms because I'm a layman at horticulture. The city scientific movement for landscaping was use the land and build according to what the land is doing and use the land's contours and its capabilities and its assets to make your own land more lovely. So um, don't create a grid of streets like New York City. If, it's, if you're building on a humpback rock that is Fairlawn Heights, for example, use the contours of the land to create your streets and build, build to accommodate the land. Don't make the land accommodate your needs. And Warren Manning was a big proponent of that. And, he, and it's exactly what he did here at Stan Hewitt, putting that home right on that promontory so it would have a magnificent view. It would get the sunset on uh, June 21 on the summer solstice exactly. And it would, it would draw you from the homes rooms out into the gardens uh, that were rooms of their own, the dell, the, road, the alleys, the Japanese garden, the lagoons, all these individual garden rooms. That was what he was creating in Fairlawn Heights and his other, and his other uh, designs. And in Goodyear Heights, I was just in Goodyear Heights, which is how I got my, my face plant. I face planted next to Blue Pond on Saturday. And um, so that's why I have these Band-Aids, which is great that it's being captured on camera. It's wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, so uh, but I face planted looking at Blue Pond, and because I, I was in Goodyear Heights driving around, it was a sunny day, blue sky, 
And Warren Manning did all that. He, he created this wonderful, these winding ways, the winding roads in Goodyear Heights. And it's a beautiful place. And if you're, if you're a rubber worker with a high school or less education, and you go to work for a rubber factory, and you're, you have this house made available to you at a pretty decent price, you've got a yard, you've got a, you know, a working bathroom, which again, in the early 1900s wasn't a guarantee. You've got this, and then you've got parks right next to you. You've got natural springs. You've got sidewalks. You've got streetcars coming, delivering you right to where you work and 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 live. And you've and and it was all designed and conceived by Warren Manning's head. So, what a what a what a man. So he did. He applied these principles to Fairlawn Heights. And here, of course, is what he did at Stan Hewitt. I use this again for presentations where people are less familiar. One interesting note. Um, Somebody asked me, uh, wasn't there a riding trail around Fairlawn Heights? And I didn't think there was, but I did do some research. And apparently, Frank Cyberling established a six-mile loop from Stan Hewitt all the way out to Fairlawn Country Club um, via what is now the Sand Run Parkway. So when you drive the Sand Run Parkway and you take those S-curves, you are riding uh, next to that creek, you're right next to the sand run, you're riding the bridle path that Frank uh, had uh, commissioned Warren Manning to create. And at least two riding clubs used the trails, uh, the Farallon Riding Academy and the Portage Riding Academy. Portage Riding Academy was located on Harvey Firestone's land. Uh, he had a, a big horse barn, and uh, he allowed uh, young people to uh, learn to ride horses and ride their horses on his land. And they would take this bridle trail in the early teens and 20s all the way out to the Farallon Country Club area and come back. So that was interesting to me. The Farallon Riding Academy was on what was known as the Medina Road, and it was really near Cleveland Maslin Road. So where that Circle K is, Cleveland Maslin and West Market Street or Route 18, that's approximately where the Farallon Riding Cat Academy was. It was way, way west at that time. That was all farmland. This is the book about Warren Manning that I've talked to you about. Um, and if you get a chance to hear Gloria Schreiber give her talk, please go. Um, Farallon Heights. So, Frank Cyberling purchased the land in dribs and drabs, and I have a nifty Excel spreadsheet that does not translate well to PowerPoint. But I showed Julie Fry, and I've got to send it to her, so that's another thing I've got to do. But I um, went online. You can now go on the Summit County property records and look at all the grantors and grantees of deeds going back to the earliest years of the county. So I have now made an Excel list of all the land that Frank and Charlie Cyberling and Ernest Fluger and several other people that are cousins of mine, Sawfields, uh, all the land that they were acquiring and selling. And you can do it for your family, too, if you want to find out where your family lived. I have a very good friend um, who is Chinese-American, and um, they, um, they owned uh, various homes as they advanced economically in Akron. They came, uh, their, 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 her, gra her grandfather came here as an immigrant. And I've been able to find out you know, where they bought their homes and how they proceed, you know, progressed through Akron. And that's a really neat gift to give somebody if you're interested in something like that. But um, so Frank Cyberling was buying this land in the teens. He, as I showed, he was buying as early as the 1890s out in Copley Township. And he had his eye on Farallon Heights uh, on that area uh, for quite a while. Edward Otis Handy, um, so Frank formed the Farallon Heights Company. Edward Otis Handy um, was born in Cleveland, Ohio. His brother was John Littlefield Handy. Jack Handy, Virginia Cyberling's husband. So this gentleman here in the photograph was the brother-in-law of Virginia Cyberling Handy. And uh, the Handys have a tradition. I've talked to my cousin Ned, who's still alive at 99 and a half. Um, so think of him and other veterans on Memorial Day. Um, but Ned, is, Ned Handy is his nephew. So the Handys had this habit of naming their sons John and Edward. And they all called them Jack and Ned. So there are like three generations of John and Edwards in the Handy family. So this was a Ned Handy. He married Alice or Sally Sawfield. She was a member of the Sawfield publishing family. Her father, um, actually, was it her father? Yeah, her father founded the company um, and uh, had worked for Warner Publishing. So he became president. He founded the company of Eaton Handy Harpham. It was a real estate development company and the Akron Development Company. And he became secretary of the Farallon Heights Company because Frank Cyberling wanted someone in real estate to partner with him to figure out what to do, how to sell the land, how to best develop it. So he partnered with Ned. They would have known each other through family and other ties. This is Ned's home. Uh, it also became the Ralph Leonard home. If any of you are familiar with Polly Keener, her father was Ralph Leonard. So uh, this is no known as uh, Blue Hill. And it is roughly located, I haven't been able to place it exactly, but it's roughly across from Summit Mall in Fairlawn on the southern side of West Market Street. Of course, the home no longer exists. 
but it had a beautiful garden, as you can see. And um, uh, this is where Ned lived. So he lived very near Farallon Heights, which was basically right behind his house. Home contracts and requirements. So um, um, one, the, the home contracts are wonderful. They're about four, you know, four pages of small type long. So if you were going to buy a home in Fallon Heights, you were going to agree to buy a piece of land that was at least an acre in size. Your home was going to be worth at least two and a half times the price that you paid for the land. You were not going to have any unsightly outbuildings on the land. You could not keep chickens or other animals. You, your garage had to conform, either be a part of your home or, be, or conform to the style of your home. You were going to use the best materials. You were not going to, you know, no shacks were going to be built. No small homes were going to be built. Although um, my home, as it's my home, is on a hill, so it looks it looks very grand. It's one room wide. My home is, you know, kitchen, dining room, hall, living room, and the McQueens added on a room at the back. But it's it's kind of funny because everybody's like, oh, you live in a giant home. I'm like, it's it's a train. It's one room wide, <laughs> but it looks good. So that's kind of cool. But but it but it's it's funny because you know um, these these homes had these specifications, and that was to keep who the riffraff out. I mean that, and that's what they, you know, that's what that's that's what it would have been called. Um, but um, it's it's so it's very interesting from a social standpoint to look at these contracts now. Um, but it also, I have to say, you, you you can use that term, keep the riffraff out. But what do homeowners associations do today? They want you to have uniformity. They want you to have your grass cut a certain height. They want you to have your home be a certain. Uh, length from the sidewalk. Everybody has to have a sidewalk. You need to have lighting. You need to conform to certain gardening specifications. That really isn't all that different from 100 years ago, with the big difference being that, you know, no discrimination based on race and so forth. So that's, that's obviously a, a very positive advancement. But, um, uh, and there's nothing specific in the land deed that discriminates by race, by the way. But uh, all of these, uh, these qualifications would have meant that only the very wealthy, of course, could purchase homes. Now, I will say to you, like I said before, you're going to find out that some of the people purchasing homes came from rags to riches. So it's wonderful to see that not just the, the, the uber wealthy purchased in Farallon Heights, it was the people that had really worked hard and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps that purchased there. Um, Farallon Heights Golf Club. So this is actually Wolcott Road. That's a pretty view of Wolcott. But Farallon Heights Golf Club was absolutely planned with the idea of serving the people of Farallon Heights. Uh, it was the it was Portage Country Club was very full, and of course these neighborhoods around here had uh, uh, it, it, Portage had a lot of members. So Farallon another golf club was needed, and it started out actually as a gun club. So there's an early map that shows the gun club. If you know Revere Road, Revere Road goes north from Market Street, and you go right alongside Portage, or right alongside Farallon Country Club. If you go up Revere Road about 3 quarters of a mile on the right, that's where the gun club was. And that was the first building built. The original clubhouse for Farallon, he Farallon Heights Golf Club was close to West Market Street, near where, their near where their tennis courts are now. So the original conception for the uh, clubhouse was actually close to West Market Street. And indeed, I found out that when they wanted to build, uh, after that burned, they had two fires that burned two clubhouses. After that burned, uh, they wanted to build this clubhouse near the homes on Overwood and Wheaton. If you're familiar with Farallon Country Club, you go up uh, Wheaton and curve right, and it runs into Overwood. This is right. This is just to the left of that curve. Uh, the, ho the homeowners on Wheaton and Overwood were a little skittish. They really didn't want a country club clubhouse near there because they didn't want the parties and the noise and all of that. Uh, I think it's worked out pretty well for everybody that belongs there. It's a lovely place. This is the original footprint of the third uh, building. Um, and then uh, it, it has been modified, of course, to now have a very classic, uh, uh, almost a Greek revival architecture with the columns. So, uh, and that's the golf club in 1930. And Frank Cyberling actually, um, there, is, there was an agreement where he was either going to sell to the club over time, or they, they, uh, they could, no, he could sell the club, he could sell to the club outright, or they were going to lease it from him for about a 20 year period, and the club decided to buy it from him. But I, I think the early years of the lease were like a dollar a year. So Frank Cyberling basically gave the land um, and I think there was some sort of payoff after that, and I'll get more details on that. Uh, I am going to write a book on this, so I'm, I'm compiling a lot of facts that I'll have that supplement this presentation. But 
Um, he was very generous with the land. He wanted another golf club and he wanted people to enjoy it and that was something that you know, he, he was very happy to have created. If you've ever played that golf course, by the way, it has wonderful valleys and canyons uh, cut by streams. So that's, yeah, there's all kinds of streams. It's a very hilly golf course. Aftermath of the 1920 crash. So Frank Cyberling uh, is asset rich and cash poor in 1920. Um, he, has, uh, he has been buying land. Uh, he has been expanding Goodyear. Goodyear was building buildings. Um, a lot of the capital was being put back into the company. Um, he was uh, involved in a bunch of other businesses as well. So he was, and Stan Hewitt had just been completed. Um, he was uh, traveling. I mean, th there were just all kinds of expenses. So he was, uh, he was, again, asset rich. He had a lot of land and things, but the liquidity was not really there. So uh, when he needed cash, uh, when, when uh, the bankers came calling and said, you know, you've, you've got these, uh, you've, you've bought your cotton and your raw materials for rubber at very high prices, prices are falling, the Fed, the Fed tightened money after World War I, um, all the banks were calling in loans, banks that had previously lent very generously to people like Frank Cyberling and other businessmen. Um, they called in their loans, and um, so of course he had to start paying, and he needed to make his payroll at Goodyear too. So um, the banks really wouldn't talk to him because he hadn't developed good relationships with New York bankers because he didn't like them. So he went to one of the first venture capital firms or, or private equity firms called Dillon Reed. It was founded by a man named Clarence Dillon who lived in Texas. Uh, he, he was from Texas and he, um, he moved to New York and he was a young man. Um, Dillon took that bet because he saw that Goodyear's balance sheet was solid. Um, he saw that it was a very great going concern and he knew that uh, if he infused cash in it, he was going to reap a, a, a great reward. And indeed, the, finance, uh, the financial records show that he did. Uh, so he saved, uh, you know, he, he infused cash into Goodyear, he helped them make payroll, but the cost of that was Frank and Charlie were either going to have figurehead roles with no control or they were going to leave, and they, they resigned in May of 1921. So Manning's plan, so 1917, all this beautiful plan by Warren Manning is abandoned because we've got a depression. People aren't buying land, they aren't buying homes, they're trying to maintain their jobs if they have them. So um, you can see here, um, so this is Manning's plan for Western Fairlawn Heights. Um, Shocklog Road was going to be a boulevard like East and West Fairlawn Boulevard is, if you're familiar with that at all. If you want to drive up Halifax Road or drive up the boulevard sometime, that's what Shocklog Road was going to look like. Shocklog Road is now just a nice two-lane road. Um, there were going to be, this, is, this was going to be a cut through here. This doesn't exist. There are homes all the way along here. Uh, Kimberly was going to be a thorough cut through to uh, Ridgewood. That doesn't happen. This doesn't exist here. Um, Western Road became Hampshire. Westwood became Chatham. Uh, Butler became uh, Parker. And, and then Croton became Covington. So these were all the old names that they were going to use. Um, and, and Somerset, a lot of them are English or Scottish names. Tinkham was named for Amos Tinkham, another man who had owned a property there. So now you can see what it looks like. This is shock log, Hampshire goes into it. So the, the Warren Manning plan of the beautiful um, vegetation, um, uh, another boulevard, um, wide, large plots, uh, the acre plots, abandoned. So uh, basically, people who had bought and could afford still built there, but building was slow until the mid-20s when, of course, we were having the roaring 20s. The economy picked up again following the 1921 depression. Um, so, and I just go into some details about the streets here. This is a fun chart that I put together based on road changes, road name changes. So uh, some, I see some of you here who have lived there or know the neighborhood, but current names, former names in 1932 and 1917, um, and and uh, then what what was changed? But that's a fun exercise to to go through and, and look at and um, to see to see what was changed when the annexation by Akron happened because those roads already existed. Hampshire Road was first Western Road, then Devonshire, then Hampshire. So um, I, I when I searched for homes on Hampshire Road, I was looking at you know Devonshire Road and I was looking for Western. So uh, Francis Cyberling, Frank's and Charlie's cousin, uh, lived on Hampshire Road. And uh, his home is going to be featured in a tour if you want to attend. I think it's $30. Uh, the Fairland Heights Neighborhood Association is having a tour of historic homes on June 12th from 1 to 5 p.m. You can buy your tickets on Eventbrite. And uh, you can see Francis Cyberling's home at 229 Hampshire if you want to go and see that. Um, these are the road name changes announced in the 1932 paper and then later in 1957. 
Chestnut Ridge Road became Halifax Road, and Ridge Road became Ridgewood Road. Um, this is kind of a fun uh, confusion of Chestnut Ridge. 10 acres on Chestnut Ridge Road, five minutes drive west of Fairlawn Heights. Well, that's actually um, Ridgewood Road. There was 10 acres on Ridgewood Road, but the writer didn't quite get that right, and the, the realtor didn't get it right, because uh, uh, Chestnut Ridge Road was a very short road. It's called Halifax now, and it's just a hill. Church of Our Savior actually bought land in Fairlawn Heights. They, they were going to occupy the point across from Pilgrim Square. In the number one, uh, you can see Church of Our Savior. They were going to occupy that whole uh, corner there uh, across from Pilgrim Square. And they did not end up, uh, they, they had, uh, I guess they bought the land, but then they never built. So they sold it again, and those are all homes now. Uh, many potential residents actually did not live or build there, and Warren Manning worked out plots according to what he was told early on by Frank Cyberling and the Fairland Heights Company. Frank envisioned a little enclave of his children owning land on what is known as the Loop in Fairland Heights. It's Ridgewood Road where it goes around that rocky cliff. Willard, Irene, uh, uh, Cora Walla, they were all going to have homes there. Willard actually kept his land for quite some time. Um, and eventually sold. But of course, none of the children ended up buying there or, or, or living there. It, Frank, Frank was going to give them the land, but that just didn't end up happening. And a lot of these names that were put on the early plans from 1917 to 1921 uh, did not pan out. You'll see in this um, plot that on Wiley Road, which became Ely, um, uh, E.R. Preston uh, is there at the corner of Tinkham and Wiley. And actually, he did, he did end up living there. Ed, Ned Handy was going to live on Tinkham Road. Uh, where uh, the the uh, a nice young couple lives right now, and their name is escaping me. And then, um, uh, he, but he didn't end up living there. He kept his home at Blue Hill. Um, so there were a lot of uh, the Kulkies. If you remember Barbara Kulke, she has a 10,000 hour pin uh, and as a former volunteer at Stan Hewitt and gave a lot of money to Stan Hewitt. Um, uh, her parents were going to live there. So a lot of people just never ended up buying. Hugh Al w. C. Schultz worked at Goodyear. He was going to own the corner house, which was later bought by uh, Byron Robinson on Hampshire Road. Uh, Hugh Allen was going to live next to him in what became um, the Keener house. Uh, Will Chase, Dr. Chase, uh, was going to own a home on uh, Tinkham Road, and uh, that didn't happen. So a lot of names that you kind of know, or Akron names, if you look into the history, were going to live there. They had grand plans, and it just didn't happen either due to the Depression or other factors. These are wonderful advertisements. I won't read them all, but they're just the language is wonderful. It's beautiful language, and it advertises Fairland Heights as really the idyllic place to live. Um, you don't want to live anywhere else after you read these advertisements. Um, and it shows, you know, it shows who who uh, the responsible citizens are uh, who are members of the Fairland Heights Company. You've got A.C. Blinn, who is Emma Rainier's great great grandfather, George Krauss, who became a congressman, um, Hugh Eaton, uh, Hugh Galt. Uh, which owned Bra the Galt's owned Brayside next to Charlie Cyberling's house. Ned Handy, you've got, um, uh, let's see, Donald Mel, um, Fairlawn Supply. Uh, Donald Mel, uh, his, uh, uh, Francis Cyberling's daughter married, uh, married him, I believe, yeah. So yeah, she became Josephine uh, Laffer, or Josephine Cyberling Mel. And then Gertrude Cyberling, these are all A.G. Sawfield. So you, these names are kind of known uh, it, kind of the, the names you find in Akron society at the time. Advertisements from 1925 to 30. So this is when the Roaring Twenties are happening. So this is before the Depression. Ideal home site, homes well located, all the lots. I mean, these, these just and the, and the prices are pretty high. I mean, um, but uh, the Eaton Handy Harpham Company, which took over and bought out the Fairlawn Heights Company uh, and took over uh, developing Fairlawn Heights, um, these, these wonderful advertisements actually show homes in their first stages before they've been modified. And then magazines like Akron Topics also advertised where, uh, where these homes had been built and who was decorating them, who was landscaping them. So the homes with yellow stars are all in Fairlawn Heights. Uh, and and uh, the other homes are mostly on Merriman Road. Early residents, um, this is a fun chart. Um, I just kind of uh, went through the names and looked at multi-generational and longest lived residents. And uh, the McDowell family had a bunch of uh, family members that lived there. The Mells, many Mells lived there. The Pfluger family, uh, several Pflugers, and, and Jim and uh, Cheryl Pfluger lived there. I haven't added them to this. Um, and I see Mrs. Towell, um, and, and I drove by her house on carpool every, you know, every day. Um, 
the Enyarts, the Baines, the Steigers, those were all siblings, all the, all the ladies were siblings. John Frank, Peter Frank, Hal Frank, Paul Frank, um, all of these people uh, uh, lived up there and, and they, they, they kept buying there because they loved it and they, if, you're, if you grew up there, you want to live there. Today's residents are every kind of um, uh, profession you can imagine and uh, they're all, uh, it's, it's very interesting to talk to people about what they're doing and a lot of them are working from home. And I get into some of the examples of homes. This was the Keener home on Devonshire, Hampshire. Uh, J. Ward Keener came from Alabama and became president uh, and CEO of B.F. Goodrich. Um, he had three sons, two of whom raised their own families in Fairlawn Heights, uh, Bob and Jeff Keener. And you can see these homes all, you can see the servants' quarters, you can see the main home, and then you've got that side wing. That's the side, that's the entrance for all the delivery folks, and then you've got the servants' quarters there on the side. You can kind of, you can start looking for stuff like that in these older homes. The Francis Cyberling and Mel family, so this is Francis Cyberling on the left and Donald Mel on the right and their grandsons. Uh, uh, Donald, Marvin, and Skip Mel. They all lived in Fairland Heights. This is Francis Cyberling's home on the top, 229 Hampshire. You can tour that on June 12th. And the home on the bottom was Donald Mel's home on, I believe it was Parker. I think it was Parker. I'm gonna get, I might get that wrong. Um, Somerset, Arthur Sawfield lived on Somerset and his uh, uh, brother, uh, Robert uh, Sutton Sawfield also lived on uh, uh, Wolcott Road. Um, I have a relation to this family because um, Margaret Manton, who was Mary Cyberling Manton's daughter, um, married Robert Sawfield. So they raised their children there. So they're, they're cousins of mine, and they were raised in that home. Um, that's on Woolcott. This home is also open uh, on the tour. This is, was Louis Dietzold's home. He was active in Trinity Lutheran Church, good German last name. Um, his son Robert attended MIT, and Lewis died in 89, at age 89 in 1963, and he built this beautiful um, home at the corner of Ely and Hampshire, and that's going to be on the tour. J.B. Huber was an attorney, and he lived on Chestnut Ridge, which is now a Ridgewood Road address, although the home faces Halifax. And uh, it's a beautiful home uh, with columns, and both front and back are lovely. That's the front, and this is the front on the other side, the back of the home off of Ridgewood. Uh, this is West Fairlawn Boulevard. This was Blake McDowell's home. He was an attorney in town. A Browse McDowell is named for him, and he also got into real estate development. It's a gorgeous uh, uh, English Tudor style home, um, and that's one of the that's one of the gate the the archways going into the gardens. It's still there. Paul Frank built this home uh, in 1927-28 at the corner of Ridgewood, Halifax, and Fairlawn Boulevard. Um, he had uh, ancestors that owned land right near, Fairlawn, right near Fairlawn Heights, and his brother, his younger brother, John Frank, is still alive and lives in Fairlawn Heights. And uh, Paul Frank was, like so many of these people, involved in all kinds of um, community activities. That's his wife featured in um, an Akron Beacon Journal article. And this is his, the back of his home and a couple of uh, architectural details. Um, it's called Classic Normandy Farmhouse. It's a lovely home. Uh, Mrs. Huber and Mrs. Frank uh, basically passed the baton of the City Hospital Women's Auxiliary Board. Uh, the, it moved, the presidency moved from neighbor to neighbor. They literally lived within like about 50 or 75 yards of each other all across the street. And that's a nice little article that talks about them. Paul Frank Jr., his son, built a home on Kimberly Road, which had a beautiful garden and uh, was recognized as such. His brothers, uh, his brother and sister, Halbert and Ann, um, uh, lived down the street at Worthington. So two Frank brothers lived right near each other on Worthington Road. And then this is Tinkham. This has a sad story. It's an amazing home. It was lately owned um, by Charlotte Steiger, and it's had two, it's on its second owner since she sold it. But this home is on Tinkham, and Carl Steinke built the home. He was a very well-renowned doctor. He was a lieutenant in the medical corps in World War I, and he was a, a kind of a leading surgeon who helped open St. Thomas Hospital. Um, Tragically, he uh, became ill and uh, decided while his wife was at a hair appointment downtown, because back then the ladies drove downtown for their hair appointments, he knew where she was going and he knew when she would return. And he actually set fire to his room. He set fire to his room in the upper right-hand corner there, those two windows, and uh, he went to commit suicide. And he knew when she would be home, and very fortunately, she did come home at the time he thought. She didn't go on another errand, because otherwise the home would have been engulfed. She was able to call the fire department. They were able to save the home, and of course, he died. 
he wanted to commit suicide. I can think of probably a lot better ways to do it than burning yourself, but it, or smoke inhalation, but tragic story. He was ill and he didn't want to live through it and he committed suicide. Um, Judy Resnick grew up on Durward. My brother delivered the newspaper to her parents. Um, and um, she, uh, a really lovely gal, she went to Skyway Drive-In, which was within a mile of where she lived. She could walk there, and that was her home on Durward. Um, this is a wonderful home on Fairlawn Boulevard. It was called Tam Haven. The H.A. Tams lived there, and it still stands. It's gorgeous. Um, it also has an interesting history because eventually um, a, nie a nephew, no, a niece of George Burns, her, her last name was Birnbaum, and that is um, George Burns' real name. Um, she married Dr. M. C. Byer, and George and Gracie, George Burns and Gracie Allen came to visit her in her home. So on that that home's uh, patio, they visited um, in the 1940s, and um, they were written up in the Akron Beacon <laughs> Journal as having visited uh, his niece. Dr. Byer had a wonderful story. Um, he volunteered to serve in World War II and went to Italy, and. Um, uh, was I believe he was wounded, and he came back and had a very successful medical practice. But he's one of those unsung heroes. You know, this man owns this grand home, and you can have a predisposition to think what you will of people that own grand homes. But he really sacrificed, left his prosperous practice, went to war when he didn't have to, and served. Uh, so quite a human being. Frank and Margaret Starbird lived in this home on East Fairlawn Boulevard. He was the advertising sales manager for Firestone Rubber Company. So here's a rubber company executive's home. I believe I went to a house sale there. One of the fun things of going to estate sales is you get to see the peekaboo factor. This is a nifty article that featured uh, the Starbird's children in their yard. And you can see the Zeppelin toy, um, which is now worth four to $500. And Stan Hewitt has one that was donated uh, by a, a woman who wanted it to go to a good home. So Stan Hewitt Zeppelin, don't, don't dent the Zeppelin up in the nursery, because it's worth a lot of money. This Dodge home, uh, this was owned by Fred and Charlotte Barnett Dodge. And um, uh, this home is hidden from view. You can only see it if you go up the driveway, because it's on, the, it's on that, um, if you remember that curve that I showed you, that Ridgewood Road curve, it's literally on the, cur on the cliff overlooking Meadowcroft Drive. If you were to clear the trees away, he, they'd have a direct view of Pilgrim Square and Fairlawn Elementary School if it weren't for the trees. Their backyard's magnificent, but the home is totally hidden from view. And um, she, uh, uh, the, so the Dodges lived here. They helped develop the Akron, the Mid-City Airport, which was Canton Akron Airport. And um, she was the daughter of one of Akron's first building contractors. Later, John Kramer owned the home. And um, a, a volunteer here, one, the Kyra Bosnick, who helped develop the gala, that was her home before she moved to South Carolina. So this is where they lived. They lived on that curve. They lived on that circle. Um, and you can see um, the, the, the house that was hidden. The Dodge Kramer house is the middle house here on the right. And then they, the Dodges also bought a couple of other lots, thinking they might build some other homes. Uh, the Lincoln Grease and Bruce Bain home uh, was a neighbor, uh, a neighbor home right there. And that home is right here. That was where Lincoln Grease, who ran the M. O'Neill Company, lived. His daughter was Jeannie Grease, and she married Lon Homeyer, and she was in my mom's wedding and one of her best friends at Old Trail School. And they went to Old Trail School right down the road on Covington Road in Fairlawn Heights. Stockbridge Road, Mr. and Mrs. William Eber Robinson, Eb Robinson. So he ran Robinson Clay Products after his cousin Henry Manton died. Henry Manton's my great grandfather. He was the husband of Mary Cyberling. So um, the Robinsons, there are several Robinsons that lived here. Nora Hamlin was his wife, and Nora Hamlin was known as Noni Robinson. Noni Hamlin Robinson. I, I did some research on her. She had a brother named Warner, who tragically, it's just one of these weird twists of fate. The day their mother died, Warner goes to downtown Akron to mail a telegram to various relatives and friends. He's distraught because their mother's just died. He's driving back up West Market Street. He hits a man with his car and drives away. His father was an executive with Goodyear who worked for Paul Litchfield. Paul Litchfield helped post his bail. And he actually, he was convicted of hit and run. Um, I believe he was put on probation, which if you're the child or wife of the storekeeper who was killed is not not something you'd want to have happen. Warner Hamlin eventually left Akron. He married a girl right after that. His life kind of fell apart. His mom died. He had this hit and run accident. He um, 
married a girl and was married for six weeks and got a divorce at a time when that was not to be known. And then he lit out for the West Coast and stayed out there. Nor Noni Robinson lived a long life, uh, dedicated to service. She, I think, died uh, well into her. She had turned 100. She went to the Cleveland Indians for her 100th birthday, went to the Cleveland Indians game. But that's where she lived in Fairlawn Heights. Ridgewood Road, you probably recognize the painting. That was done by Gertrude Cyberling. She was friends with the Vaughns, so she painted their home twice. Uh, my mom bought a painting on eBay about 20 years ago and gave it to Stan Hewitt. And then a few years ago, Deb Selden found one on eBay, and she gave it to Stan Hewitt. So um, it's the W.A.M. Vaughn home, and um, it is featured here in a view from October 1934, and then the current home, uh, and it's right on Ridgewood Road. Byron Robinson, um, a cousin of Ebe Robinson, William Eber Robinson, he owned this home at the corner of Hampshire and Wolcott. Byron Robinson died at a very young age. His wife was Dorothy Dick. She was the daughter of Senator Charles Dick, who was friends with the Cyberling family and had a home uh, in the Highland Square or West Hill area. Uh, B.W. Robinson's widow, Dorothy, married a man named Gertner and um, eventually moved away. And in fact, there is an advertisement during the Great Depression for this home, Will Trade. There were homes in Farallon Heights and elsewhere in Akron where they were so big that the owners did not want to, they, they didn't have the money to keep them up, so they were willing to trade anyone with a smaller home who was willing to take on their home. Not even selling, they just wanted to trade to get out from under the cost of living in the home. That's a, the Depression, we, we don't think about how bad things were. It, was, it, was, it, it got pretty ugly. Um, here's the Vaughn home again, um, and this is in winter, an older photo, and the current, and oh, this is, uh, yeah, this is the Vaughn home, and its twin is across the street. There's a, there's a, um, there's a twin, uh, the lower left is the twin house across the street, and the Vaughn home is on the right. Sorry, that's out of order. Julius Buckholzer, Francis Cyberling Buckholzer married his son, Richard. So Francis, Francis, uh, my cousin Fran, who is Charlie's granddaughter, um, uh, TK's daughter, TK Cyberling's daughter, married this man's son, but Julius Buckholzer has a great life story. He was an immigrant, came here no, with nothing in his pocket, uh, went to work for the Howard Department Store, made, um, eventually bought the Howard Department Store and helped develop the entirety of East Akron. Uh, Buckhol Buckholzer Boulevard, Chapel Hill Mall, the Buckholzer family developed all of that and his son Dick continued in that family tradition. They lived here on Ridgewood Road. Uh, a total rags to riches story, just an amazing life story I knew nothing about before I researched this. The Apples, uh, Johnny Apple's parents lived here, and of course his mother was Julia Albrecht. She's part of the Albrecht family uh, of Ivan and Hurl Albrecht and Acme, um, the business, at the Acme markets. Uh, Alan Ayers lived here at 2019 Ridgewood. You remember I said, you, there, when I said the heights in Farallon Heights and I showed you that driveway that was very, very steep at the beginning of the presentation. This is the home. It's literally built on rock. On Everything falls away from the house. You can't, there's nothing flat. There's no flat land around the house. It's all, it's just, it's totally on a hump. I, I it's, it's an, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to live there, but it's a neat house. The Jeta, this is one of the stories that I found that was just makes your heart break. Uh, this man was a leading Allstate insurance agent. He lived just a couple blocks from me and he had three sons. Two of them died before the man turned 50. One in Vietnam and another in an auto accident at Kent State. Just, you know, you can live in a beautiful place, you can have a lot of money, tragedy still happens. Tragedy happened to this family. They live in, in a mid-century modern home on Inverness. Um, one of the newer homes that was built in the neighborhood, you can see obviously it's very modern and there's a twin home on Holgate below it. But, um, they were regularly on a Christmas tour, and um, in 1964, a mother and daughter were headed to St. Paul's Church early on a Sunday, and they uh, are killed uh, right at the, I don't think they were killed by a train, but they were in an auto accident where the train crosses Market Street near Wallhaven. Uh, so mother and daughter died on a Sunday morning. So just, you know, there's a lot, and then I'm gonna go through these quickly. Samuel and Catherine Zilio, um, he was, President General Manager of the Commercial Printing and Lithography Company, and he um, was big into the chamber. She was on the Children's Hospital Women's Board, which was as prestigious then as it is now. Um, they married in, in 1904, and um, uh, so um, he had known when he was working, with, he had known her when he was working with her first husband. So she was the widow of a newspaper editor, and they raised her children. This is their home. It's one of the largest homes in Fairlawn Heights. It is um, at the corner of uh, Wheaton and Ridgewood Roads. 
This is the view of the back, both in 1930 and 1921, and 2021. This is Mr. Zilio. This is the front of the home. You can see it. This is the back of the home. The back of the home's on the top. The front of the home's on the bottom. It's like Stan Hewitt. Back and front, you can choose which one you call. But the back, the back door is on the top. The front, with the beautiful two stories of windows, is on the bottom. It is just a large home. And um, a relative of the Pflugers, a descendant of the Pfluger family, a, a, um, lives there now, which is wonderful, with their young family. But this is South Wheaton. It's a beautiful, rambling home. Mr. Milhoff built this home right across from Fairlawn Country Club. You'd pass it every time you go into Fairlawn. It's the English manorial style. And this is the backyard with a nice fountain there. This is on East Fairlawn Boulevard. Robert Ginther was an attorney uh, in Akron, very well-known attorney. And the brick is now painted white. Um, they're, 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 it was painted white back then. This is their home now, as, uh, as it looks right now. You can see the tower there. This home burned a couple of years ago. Um, Cornus Hill Mansion was owned by Russell Firestone, uh, one of the sons of Harvey. And it is on the other tall hill of Fairlawn Heights. Um, it is right next to a nursing home now. And it, it burned a few years ago because some kids uh, left a, a twig burning. And um, it, it uh, is now no longer. The Dorner home looks like Tara. <laughs> it's got the beautiful beautiful columns. This was owned by Dr. and Mrs. Fred, Dr. and Mrs. Arthur Dorner. Um, and then later on, the Rickards family moved in there. And this is on Hampshire Road. These are the plans that Jim Palau found of the home and donated to the University of Akron. So wonderful plans show the detail of the home that Roy Firestone invested in his homes. He also um, designed the Dietrich Gustav Rempel home, which is being redone and refurbished by its current owner. Mr. Rempel is another rags to riches story. Um, the home took three years to construct, but he was an immigrant from Russia with four siblings, came here as an orphan following the Russian Revolution. You can't get much more destitute than that. But America was good to him. He went to work for Sun Rubber and then founded the Rempel Manufacturing Company and made his money on toys. So if you collect a Rempel toy, um, you will know that um, that man um, was able to go from nothing to a mansion that is bespoke. It is absolutely, there's so many unique elements in it, it's amazing. And this is uh, his home. Uh, again, it's a Roy Firestone plan. You can see the detail, 26 rooms. Organ was built by the Schantz Company, which restored Stan Hewitt's organ. Bathrooms, all types of wood. He got down to the nitty gritty detail just like Charles Schneider did with um, uh, the windows, the, the craftsmanship, uh, the, the, just, it's, it's a gorgeous home. This is a Roy Firestone home uh, on Stockbridge and East Fairland Boulevard. There's the plan that Jim Paolo had. And it's just a one-story home, no basement, because of that solid rock. And then I just found some architectural patterns. There are a lot of homes in Fairland Heights. The unique homes, these, this is the twin homes, the Vaughns. But um, a lot of homes have the towers. So I just, try, I just went and found some similar elements. There's the Cape Cod. Um, lots of unique features, like interesting little windows and uh, jutting windows and uh, porches. And then um, now the schools. Um, Old Trail School and Fairlawn School were the two schools. Old Trail was private. It was founded in 1926. Um, excuse me, 1920, 1920, I apologize, 1920. And um, it eventually ended up in Fairlawn Heights in a beautiful Tudor-style school building. Fairlawn Elementary School at the bottom here was the school that my brother and I attended as children. Um, and it was torn down a few years ago. It was built in 1929 for, it was in Portage Township, but it served the Fairlawn crowd and the crowd near uh, Braywick, Braywick and Wilshire and Ganyard. Um, and it has been be rebuilt as Resnick CLC. And then the end of my program just discusses the fact that in the 1960s, Akron was growing and we needed a highway. So Route 21 became I-77 and they decided to build, um, they had to, the residents of Fairlawn Heights had to deal with a highway that was being built near and they lobbied to have it go around the neighborhood, which was very fortunate, but it was still near enough that you can, you can still hear, the, you know, you can hear the cars and trucks. But um, that is an early view of the expansion of the highway. Um, this is the west end of Bryce, and it's looking at that exit from Miller Road. So the truck is on Miller Road going south on to 77, and the road here going this way is Ridgewood. 
and the Circle K is right there. There's an office. There are office buildings there now. And these homes are on Bryce Road, right at the end of Bryce Road. That's West Akron. That's as West in Akron as you can get, because right next to it is Fairlawn. I want to thank you for having me. I'm sorry I took so long. Um, I am grateful to you, and I would encourage you to give and support any organization that preserves history, like the libraries um, and Stan Hewitt, of course. The University of Akron Archives can use your help. Um, and I am grateful to Julie Fry and many of my friends here at Toivo and Tom McKenzie and Jim Urban here at Stan Hewitt. And I'm grateful that you had me speak. And thank you for listening. And I apologize for talking too long. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I know you don't didn't expect it, but no. we have a little God surprise for you. you. If it's anything with Stan Hewitt on it, I'm excited. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. So much. Thank uh, you. That was very interesting. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm sure we all enjoyed that, uh, and we hope to maybe bring you back again for something else. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> you probably want your computer. No, I'm okay. Right, I'm right. Sorry. Uh, before we all leave, I think uh, Linda would like to make an announcement. <laughs> for next week, for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Street. So our next meeting will be the picnic. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you are invited to come. You're, we will provide the main dish. And if you would be kind enough to bring a little surprise to go with it, we'd appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you in July. OK? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's right. It's the next. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for all for coming. And thank you, Harriet, for the presentation. Uh, Hope to see you at the picnic, uh, and please drive safely. Until next time, thank you. Many thanks to Harriet Chapman for sharing her vast knowledge of Fairlawn Heights as well as the Cyberlene family with the Stan Hewitt Guild members. The Stan Hewitt Guild and Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens partners in volunteer service to benefit beautiful and historic Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens.